Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We meet each one to one. I'm pleased to welcome Lily Coppell to the program. You've seen her byline in the New York Times and other publications. But today, she's here to tell us about her relationship with another writer, a young girl who lived on the east side of Manhattan. Starting in August of 1929, she wrote in her diary every day. Lily's odyssey, which began when she, when she found the diary, continued as she retraced the life of Florence Wolfson. It's brought the past face to face for both Lily and Florence. The result, the red leather diary, reclaiming a life through the pages of a lost journal. It has just been released in paperback by HarperCollins. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Why don't you start at the beginning, you know, how you got to Manhattan and to 98 Riverside Drive and your job at the Times? Sure. Well, I grew up in Chicago. I actually grew up in Hyde Park, the neighborhood Obama and his family have called home. Um, and I moved to New York to go to college at Barnard. And after graduating from Barnard, I had this wildly romantic notion of what being a writer was all about and sort of all of Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. I figured I would rent a place, somehow afford it, finish my novel, break into the publishing world, you know, this very easy three-step plan. Well, everything didn't quite go as follows. I ended up renting a room from a rather eccentric and demanding woman on the city's Upper West Side, and I landed a job as a news clerk on the Metro desk of the New York Times. By night, I started reporting on celebrities for the paper's boldface names column, and I was interviewing Clint Eastwood, and James Gandolfini asked me out on a date, Shirley MacLaine tried to convince me of a past life. <laughs> but I was really searching for a larger story, one that touched my life and other people, and of course, love. And I happened upon this in a really unusual way, which is one morning, it was October 6, 2003, I stepped outside of my building, and it was an old pre-war on 82nd Street in Riverside Drive, 98 Riverside Drive, and there was this dumpster filled with about 50 old steamer trunks parked outside of the building's awning. And each one was riveted in brass and plastered with these vintage travel labels from Paris and London and Monaco, really like a scene out of Titanic. And despite being late and dressed for work, I just figured they wouldn't be around long, suddenly was grabbing the dumpster's grimy edge, pulling myself up, and started excavating, all the, one, all the time sort of wondering when I'd had my last tetanus shot as right. I made my <laughs> way over this pile. But each trunk really opened like a small treasure chest. And half were fitted with drawers and then hangers on the other side. And I found this flapper dress. I found a stunning coat from Bergdorf's, which is tangerine boucle, which I still wear. There was an entire collection of vintage handbags, a lucite box purse, a beaded you really scale got into evening the, bag. You really got into the New York tradition of picking through the, the trash, right? <laughs> That's very New York. I did. Uh, I and, know. And, you know, a rummaging and, you know, gleaning. <laughs> and there were the like garbage. old West Side couples that were stopping by that said, God, I, if I was younger, I'd be in there with <laughs> you. You know, like people practically handing me up a bagel because I ended up staying in this, let's call it an archaeological site all day. You didn't go to work. I didn't go to work. I called in the desk and I said, listen, this is an incredible story. You should send a photographer down. They did. They sent down Don Hogan Charles, who's a wonderful photographer, mm -hmm. and he got pictures of the whole scene. Um, there were labels like property of the Diary of Anne Frank Hotel from Amsterdam, these dreamy paintings of ocean liners. Well, I stayed in until nightfall. and. At night, there was one street lamp that was located above, which conveniently illuminated the scene. And I brought up 
typewriters and old photographs to my apartment. But one of the things to emerge from this urban shipwreck was this crumbling red leather diary kept by a young woman named Florence Wolfson from 1929 to 1934. And once I found the diary, all of the other things sort of just dissolved as props. I was absolutely transported into this young woman's world. She was a writer and a painter, the daughter of two Russian Jewish immigrants who was really trying to carve an artistic life for herself. She wrote over 2,000 entries, never skipping a day in the diary's five years. It was this scrawling blue and black cursive that filled each of these gold-edged pages. and. I suddenly found myself almost connected to a kindred spirit, but one that was coming of age during the Depression. And it started when she was 14? Was it 14? 14. Okay. Though I had no idea when I first began it. I mean, parts really read like a sex in the city of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Florence mm -hmm. writes, she's ecstatic about riding horseback through Central Park like an early Marjorie Morning Star. She's reading Baudelaire. She had love affairs with both men and women. At first I thought I had found sort of the chronicle of a nice Jewish daughter and it, at a certain point I stumbled upon this entry, slept with Pearl, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. nothing so gratifying as physical intimacy with one you like. But Florence in her writing was really exploring herself intellectually, artistically, and sexually. Um, you held onto the diary for three years before you decided to go and look for Florence. What made you decide to go and look for her? Well, there are entries like one of my favorites, which is stuffed myself with Mozart and Beethoven. I feel like a ripe apricot. I'm dizzy with the exotic. And I thought, I want to feel like a ripe apricot. I mean, Florence really was someone who embraced the city. She was, I think, who many people want to be when they move to the city. Mm -hmm. She was this witty, sophisticated young woman. The rules didn't appeal, really appeal or apply to her, it seemed. She was hosting a literary salon at 19 at Columbia, which famous poets came to, Delmore Schwartz and John Berryman. She was, she was obsessed with a famous stage actress. And I felt that I needed to figure out how this young woman's story ended because it was going to reveal something about my life and I felt the lives of other people. And so I, she was just so compelling that one, you wanted to meet her and also you wanted to see how the story, to fill in the gaps? Yeah, I mean, she penned her last entry on the eve of her 19th birthday. One of her entries is, wrote all day and my story is still incomplete. And I really had the sense that I had picked up this young woman's story where it had left off, but I wanted to know what had happened to this young woman who seemed so bent on transforming the world right. around her. Mm -hmm. I mean, why had she disappeared into history? It's really a fascinating look, glimpse into sort of upper class uh, or upper middle class Jewish life at that particular point in time. And her life was you know, was so rich because she said she, she, was, well, she was affluent, she read widely, she went to Broadway plays, she studied drawing at the Art Students League, she played tennis, she studied dance, she wrote stories, she went to great parties, she had all these boyfriends, she went to the Rockaways during the right. summer. Uh, except the, the diary, it was in the, the, the middle of the Depression, you know, and it was sort of a a bubble to a certain extent mm -hmm. that she and her family were were living in or not no it was i mean we tend to hear the stories about people um surviving on the lower east side i mean what was unusual about her family was just how fast how quickly they sort of um, attained their place in life. Both of her parents came to the country in 1906 um, without speaking a word of English, both as teenagers. Her mother became a seamstress and then would eventually own this couture dress shop on Madison Avenue. Her father was a physician who during the Depression treated patients for as little as one dollar a month. And you see 
the depression, it's sort of the periphery of Florence's diary. I mean, she saw the shanty towns in Central Park. She had friends at Hunter who, you know, even had a hard time coming up with the nickel subway fare as it was then. And Florence knew she was privileged, but I think she was someone who really was just trying to create her life. And, um, you know, she saw herself as almost like a literary heroine. So mm -hmm. there might have been more hardship that she didn't speak about. Her father sort of battled depression. Right. She actually chronicles Black Tuesday. And the parents didn't get along at all. No, they didn't. Would you have wanted to be her friend? I wanted to be her friend, <laughs> and I am her friend. But I mean, back then, at that time. Yeah, I think yeah. she's a fascinating person. I mean, some people come away from reading the book and they say, well, you know, she was so opinionated. She seemed sort of difficult. But the truth is, I couldn't have picked whose diary I found. Right, right. But she was such an unusual woman for her time. I mean, she, this famous stage actress, Eva Ligellian, who is really at the forefront of American theater, Florence, feels she is meant to meet, much as I felt like I was meant to know Florence, and goes to meet her backstage, tries to pursue a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. She sails to Europe in 36 and has this love affair with an Italian count. A faux count, as it turns out, but you know. It Though was actually the story's kind of, the plot thickens. Recently I got an email from a woman who had been married to the count and had been known as Countess Canaletti, so now I'm not sure if he was faux or vrai. Well, she made it up to right. <laughs> she might not have known. Everybody in that, that Florence knew seems to be so attractive, so physically attractive. It's almost something like in you know, a story out of great, the Great Gatsby, you know. They're all beautiful, you know. Um, the, the, the guy she eventually married, I mean, it was, was one of seven beautiful brothers or... Right. Or, I mean, know? it sounds like a fable, doesn't right. it? Right, right, right. But you have to think that this is this woman who wants to be a painter and a writer. She's writing about going to the Museum of Modern Art when it first opened in 1929, and she says, went to the Museum of Modern Art and almost passed out from sheer jealousy. Mm -hmm. I can't even paint an apple yet. It's heartbreaking. So this is a 15-year-old comparing herself to Cezanne's right, right, apples, right, you know? Right. But she was reading all the decadent poets, and, you know, this is right after the flapper era, and, you know, physical beauty and sort of athleticism were really prized characteristics. It was that whole classical Greek right, right, model. Right. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back after the following message. You promised me the world. Is this what you had in mind? Every choice we make has a consequence. Help Earthshare and its members restore balance to the world. Visit earthshare.org and see what you can do. Earthshare, one environment, one simple way to care for it. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. I'm talking with the writer Lily Coppell, author of The Red Leather Diary, Reclaiming a Life Through the Pages of a Lost Journal. It's just been published in paperback by HarperCollins. You know, I'm very fascinated uh, with how people in nonfiction books recreate the past. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read yeah, a few passages from your book, and you're talking about, this is when Florence is 14, she's walking down Fifth Avenue. The streets were crowded. Men wore fedoras and women wore gray, brown, and occasionally maroon suits with calf -length skirts cut on the bias and razor-sharp pleats, all clicking along on high heels. They seemed to be walking too fast, like actors in a jumpy old black and white reel. Not a strand of hair protruded from under the hard line around the faces. And just a little later, she's riding a double double-decker bus down Fifth Avenue. Uh, in one apartment, a French maid in a lace apron haughtily drew the tassel drapes. Now, my question is, in the reconstruction of little teeny tiny details, mm -hmm. like 
skirts cut on the bias, razor sharp pleats, people seem to be walking too fast, uh, people wearing hats where you can't see any of the hair underneath, the French maid in, in a lace apron drawing the tassel mm -hmm. drapes. Now, are those, all of those Florence's memories, or is this partly your reimagining the period? Well, the book is really an amalgam of memoir and biography, but it's all based on her diary entries and original interviews. It begins with my discovery, and then using the diary is really a portal to recreate her 1930s world. Mm -hmm. So I had dozens of hours of interviews with Florence where she would remember riding the Fifth Avenue bus and you would sit on the top and couples would specifically sit there to neck right. and she remembered looking into the Fifth Avenue apartments it was like this little voyeuristic almost mini theater and looking into these lavish apartments like the ones that were depicted in romantic comedies mm -hmm. of the era like mm -hmm. Dinner at Eight, right. you know? Right. So, by, I used those memories of Florence's, which were all based, in fact, to really paint a picture of her life. I mean, it was part of the challenge of sort of traveling back in time and, you know, hoping to recapture her era that I had to, almost as a writer, you know, cast myself as this actress taking on her role and right. using her interviews in her diary as a script. Um, they parts about the skirts cut on the bias and the hats with the line across the women's faces. I mean, that was all from research about the fashions mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. era mm -hmm. and also Florence's recollection of just, it was an era where women wore gloves and carried pocketbooks and right. the men were in hats. Right. You know, those were all words that came from her. And I think you really hear her voice coming through her entries, which are interspersed mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. the book. Mm -hmm. But everything is based in research. Yeah. There even is this recollection of the little figurines of the Roman god Mercury that were on each of Fifth Avenue's traffic lights. Right. So what I wanted the reader to feel was that they had found her world just as I had when I found her diary. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I've learned from, and this is from, from uh, writing courses that I've taken, is that, I mean, there's some things that people can remember, and some people are better at remembering detail than others, but some stuff you have to fill in, you know, and that's part of the art of writing memoir, biography. Yeah, I mean, history. you do have to remember it is in art. I mean, people want to read a story. It's not a legal document but I took great care to make sure everything was factual. And I went back and I found programs from the theater performances mm -hmm. she went to. And Florence at 90 has an incredible memory. Mm -hmm. I mean, she remembered what her, the details of her teenage bedroom. And she remembered um, being nine years old and um, a housekeeper who had really raised Florence and her younger brother was leaving and they put a, a teacup down on the table in their Harlem brownstone where she spent her like early tears in yeah, <laughs> years and cried into it and she didn't leave. And I said, well, mm -hmm. Florence, did it really fill up with tears? And she said, I remember it filling up with tears, right. but who knows? <laughs> right, right. In college, and she went to, went to Hunter College when it was uh, a women's college, she, I, you know, I, I was she had sexual affairs with several women. Um, was this just and 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 when you met her in her 80s or 90s, she was pretty blasé about them. Was this just something that women did at the time? Right. Well, the diary was studded with these intimate details. One was slept with Pearl. The other was this mysterious young British blonde named M. I mean, there were also you know names like Matt, Nat, and Manny and George, all hearts she had chipped if not broken. Well, I said Florence very delicately at first because I didn't know how far I had gone in my voyeuristic glimpse into her life. I said, well, who is Pearl? And she said, oh, Pearl was one of my admirers. And one of Florence's daughters who is there, Valerie, said, well, what do you mean, Ma? And she said, well, like Virginia Woolf in Vita Sackville mm -hmm, West. Mm -hmm. She said there was this book at the time called The Well of Loneliness, which I've since read by Radcliffe Hall. And it was written in the 20s about two women in this relationship. And 
there were all of these currents beyond just a lesbian relationship of this being sort of an art form and some sort of initiation as a writer and just this meeting of two minds and sort of a melding of artistic sensibilities. And I think Florence's quest throughout the diary and I think her enduring quest was just um, to find understanding and to figure out who she was. Mm -hmm. And so these two relationships um, with women she befriended at Hunter, I think they were really sort of landmarks of her um, figuring out who she was. Right. It's so interesting to me. I mean, Americans are pretty, still prudish about sex, even after a supposed sexual revolution, even in 2009. But even in much, you read and you find that in much earlier periods, people were just going at it like rabbits. People, there was a, so much sex going on and across, you know, with, with, you know, not only across gender lines, but with people of the same sex. I mean, yeah, well brought up Jewish girl. I know, I mean, she totally unbuttoned my whole notion of a 1930s right. girl, especially when I started hearing about Florence's literary salon that she told me about right. when she hosted it at 19. It was this whole group of depression era stamped children, mostly of immigrants, who are really trying to carve out an artistic life for themselves. And they really reminded me of almost the children of the 60s. You know, Florence remembered bending down, and this is almost a direct quote from her, bending down to light the fireplace. And as she did, she would unpin her long blonde hair and let it cascade down her shoulders as her members debated the poetics of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. Wow, we didn't have discussions like that when I, <laughs> when I, when I was out of college. But, okay, and then at she marries, um, you know, after going to Europe and having this wonderful uh, tour of Europe, basically on her own, and having affairs uh, with the count, or no count, whatever, you know, it was, coming back, uh, and having the salon, uh, hosting the salon, and then she, finally she marries Nat Howitt. And how, how old was she when she married him? She was, it was the eve of her 24th birthday. Okay. And then she settled into, well, she continued to write. She was a journalist and she wrote for magazines and she was a sort of columnist, freelance writer, but sort of settled into suburban married life, or no? What would you say? Well, that's sort of the climax of this book. I mean, when I finally met Florence through finding her with this private investigator at 90, at first I had no idea she would still be alive. She just said, from reading about this young woman in the diary's pages, how did I end up living this ordinary life? And I think I always thought I was going to meet a writer and a, or a painter based on her diary. I mean, she really seemed to um, feel that she she really wanted to make a mark on the world as a literary mm -hmm. you know figure, and many of her friends did go on to do so. But she got married on the eve of her twenty fourth birthday. She eloped with her husband, who she'd first met at thirteen, as you said, he was this Greek god she described him as um, that she met in the Catskills, sort of a dirty dancing of the nineteen thirties. And she started writing these edgy feminist tinged articles, but little by little had two children, got into the stock market. Um, she described in the 1950s, she was the only woman um, bringing her kids to the park in dungarees. All the other women around her seemed to be in skirts and sweater sets. And then from the park, she'd put them into their stroller and they would go to her brokerage firm where she would monitor her stocks. I mean, Florence was always this rare combination of sort of beauty and intellect. And she mm -hmm. always wanted to be one of the boys, one right. of the men. I right. mean, sort of. But you sort of saw, you know, the. Uh, th what the pressures of the time sort of forced or encouraged women to be. Uh, I mean, it's sort of like what, um, I'm trying to think, uh, the woman who wrote the pioneering book, she s slipped my mind uh, about, you know, bright women being forced into the, in, 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 into the home. That sort of happened to her in a sense, even though she 
fought it. It's true. And I mean, she was always questioning of her role. She never felt like one of the other women in the country club. She said she always loathed talking about her hair or her nails. Um, she went to a Freudian psychoanalyst and she was really searching for something else. And she said, he said, you know, your role is to be a mother and a wife. And, you know, almost 40 years later, she said, and I was stupid enough to believe right, him. Right, right, but right. She was someone who wanted it all. But I think the beauty of this book was really um, being able to peer under this seemingly ordinary life. And Florence just says she no longer feels like an older woman. Even people she's known for years, women in her bridge circle, mm -hmm. I mean, they had no idea of this rich and complex mm -hmm. life under the surface. When you met her, did you recognize the girl you had met in the diary? I did. You know, it was in her eye. It was in her just receptiveness to letting a stranger into her life. I mean, it. this diary, I mean, it was very personal. She sort of said, well, how did she feel about all of these intimate moments and thoughts being on public display? Well, the young Florence would have said, go for mm -hmm. it. And I think that's really who she still is mm -hmm. today. And she wrote an incredible forward to the book when she just talks about what does it feel like when a forgotten chunk of your life is handed back to you. And at 19 in her salon, all of her members were pursuing the Socratic quest of know thyself. And I really feel like Florence is still doing that mm -hmm. today. She got a laptop and she's writing again. The Huffington Post wants to get her blogging. And she's really having this second act. And um, did she learn anything from her about how to live one's life? I definitely did, and that's why I longed so much to meet her. You know, I felt that, um, you know, I saw so many parallels between us as young women. I thought her later life would sort of reveal something about perhaps the path I might take. And I think I've learned from her just never to compromise. I mean, I do want to become a writer, and as romantic as that still seems to me many days, um, you know, I don't. I hopefully don't want to have some of the regrets that mm -hmm. she had. I think it is easier for women today to have a balance and between, a right? Exactly. But you know, always, always moving forward and right. developing it more. Um, but I also learned that it's not all that conventional to want love and security in a family, and that there truly is an art in just living your life. And I always felt the diary was a work of art when I found it. Mm -hmm. And when I think about a diary as a literary form, I mean, it's not this polished, finished work, but it's just a record of somebody's daily experience, right. internal and external. And I felt that meeting Florence really completed the diary. Wonderful. We're out of time. But I want to thank Lily Coppell for joining us. The Red Leather Diary, Reclaiming a Life Through the Pages of a Lost Journal, has just been published by HarperCollins. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.